Well, hello everybody again. It's good to see you all here for session number two of this series. Uh, we're talking about the great controversy between good and evil and how God solves this problem uh, through the sanctuary service. Now before we begin our study this evening, which is titled God's Judgment Process, we do want to ask for the Lord's special presence with us. And so I invite you to bow your heads with me as we pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for uh, bringing us to this place once again. I thank you for all of those who have taken time from their busy, busy schedule to come and be at this meeting tonight. And we ask that you will be with us through the presence of your Holy Spirit, that you might give us understanding, and that we might know that you are taking all the necessary steps to vindicate your character once and for all, forever, before the universe. And we thank you for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. In our last study together, we were reading some verses that indicate that all of the universe is observing the problem of evil as it develops, not only in this world, but in heaven as well. And so I want to begin with one of those texts that we studied yesterday, 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 9. And uh, it's very unusual that I would read a text from the New International Version. I'm actually a New King James guy. But uh, the translation in the NIV, I believe, captures best the meaning of this text so that it's very understandable. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 9, the Apostle Paul writes, For it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display. So notice Paul is saying that the apostles are on display. Uh, the word display here is the word apodeknumi, which means to demonstrate, to expose to view, or to exhibit. In other words, there's some aspect in which the, the apostles are being exhibited. So notice once again, for it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession, like men condemned to die in the arena. So he's using the illustration of uh, what was done in Rome by taking criminals to the Colosseum to have them fight with wild beasts while the spectators watch what was happening. And so basically the Apostle Paul is saying, us apostles are being taken to the arena as a display or as a demonstration. And then uh, he continues writing, we have been made, that is the apostles have been made, a spectacle. The word spectacle is the Greek word theatron from where we get the word theater. In other words, this is a drama that is taking place. And it's being observed by witnesses. And the apostles are on display before these witnesses. Now, I want to read particularly the last part of this verse. It says, we have been made a spectacle, that is a theater, to the whole universe. The word there that is used is the word cosmos. To angels as well as to men. So notice the apostles were on display there, this was a theatrical, a real theatrical display that was being viewed or testified to by men as well as by angels. In other words, heaven and earth are both observing and watching what is happening here on this earth. And then we read 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 12 where it's speaking about the message that was given to the Old Testament prophets. And I read there from 1 Peter 1 verse 12, to them, that is to the prophets of the Old Testament, it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. So in other words, the apostles wrote not for their time primarily, they wrote for our time because what they wrote about is fulfilled in our time. And notice the last part of the verse. Things which angels desire to look into. So basically, the plan of salvation, which was described by the prophets, which is fulfilled in our time, 
are, uh, has to do with things that angels desire to look into. Angels are studying the plan of salvation, in other words. Let's notice a few other verses that show that not only this world, but heaven is involved in witnessing the great controversy that is transpiring here on this earth. Notice Colossians chapter 1 and verses 19 and 20. Colossians chapter 1 verses 19 and 20. It says, Therefore it pleased the Father that in Him, that is in Jesus, all the fullness should dwell. And by Him, that is by Jesus, to reconcile all things to Himself. By Him, that is by Jesus. Whether things on earth or things where? Or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of His cross. So notice the cross not only reconciles the earth with God, but it also reconciles what? It reconciles heaven with God, because heaven catches a glimpse of what the character of God is truly like. Notice Luke chapter 15 and verse 10. Heaven is very closely linked with planet earth. Heaven is watching what is happening on planet earth. They're involved in the situation here. Notice Luke chapter 15 and verse 10. Speaking about the angels, it says, Jesus is speaking, by the way, Likewise I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So when a sinner repents on earth, does that have implications or repercussions in heaven? It most certainly does, because Jesus said that there is joy in the presence of the angels when one sinner repents. Notice Luke chapter 12 and verse 8. Time and again we have this theme that heaven is involved in this controversy on earth. They are not only involved as witnesses, but they are actively involved as well. Luke 12 and verse 8. And we'll also read verse 9. Jesus is speaking once again, Also I say to you, whoever confesses me before men, him the Son of Man also will confess before whom? Before the angels of God. But he who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. So notice, uh, our names are being confessed before the angels. The angels are observing our cases, in other words, in the judgment. Notice Revelation chapter 3 and verse 5. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 5 once again speaks about uh, God presenting our name before the angels. It reads there, once again, Jesus is speaking, He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. There it is again. Notice the angels are involved with what's happening on this earth. Notice also Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians 3 and verses 8 through 11. This is a rather long passage, but it has very many important points. This is how it reads. To me, that is to Paul, who am less than the least of all saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see. Notice he's saying, I'm preaching so that everyone can see. Can see what? Let's continue. And to make all see... What is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ to the intent that now the manifold witness of God might be made known by the church. Now notice that the manifold wisdom of God needs to be demonstrated. Notice to whom it needs to be demonstrated to. It's demonstrated by the church to the principalities and powers, where? In heavenly places, according to the eternal purpose which He accomplished in Jesus Christ our Lord. So once again, you have the idea that the church is to make, make known the plan of salvation, not only on this earth, but to the principalities and powers in heavenly places. That's referring not only to the angels, but it's referring to the inhabitants of other worlds as well. Notice Romans, 
Uh, well, before we go to Romans, let's go to Psalm 51, verses 1 through 4. And then we'll go to Romans 3 and verse 4. There's a little difference here. Uh, Romans 3, verse 4 quotes Psalm 51, but in the quotation, it changes it a little bit. You know, if I was asked uh, to ask you, in the judgment, who is it that is judged? You probably would say, well, we are the ones who are judged. God judges us. But there's another sense in which during the judgment, it is God who is being judged. Now notice what we find in Psalm 51 and verses 1 through 4. Of course, this is the penitential psalm of David after he committed adultery with Bathsheba and after he had her husband killed in the battlefront. It says there, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Does God say that we are all sinners, yes or no? The Bible says that we are all sinners. God says that we are all sinners. Now if we openly confess that we are sinners, is God judging us correctly? Absolutely. But what if we should say uh, that we're not sinners? Well, then we run into certain problems. Now notice how Romans 3 and verse 4 quotes uh, this verse or these verses from Psalm 51. It says there, let God be true, this is Romans 3 verse 4, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it, that is those who say that they haven't sinned, as it is written, now speaking about God, that you may be justified in your words and may overcome when you are judged. Did you catch that? In Psalm it says, you know, you will be found guiltless when you judge. But when it's quoted by Paul in Romans 3 and verse 4, he says that you might be found, what? That you might be found just when you are judged. And so basically, in the judgment, God is judging us. But in the process of judging us, God himself is being judged by the universe to see if God is pronouncing a righteous and a true judgment. Perhaps the clearest indication that we have in the Bible of this connection between heaven and earth, of this uh, involvement of heaven with earth, is in the story of Job. I wish I had a couple of hours just to talk about the story of Job, but we don't have the time to do it, so let me just synthesize. In Job chapter 1, it says that the sons of God come to present themselves before the Lord, and among them comes Satan. And then God says to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? He is a blameless man. He eschews evil. And he's righteous even though he lives in your territory. I'm paraphrasing what God says. And Satan says, Oh, well of course he's faithful to you. Because you favor him. You remember one of the arguments that Lucifer used in heaven? Oh yeah, you have favor. Your son is your favorite. Yeah, you take him under your wing. You don't let anybody else in. And so the, de so the devil says, or Satan says to God, well, you know, of course he serves you because you do everything good to him while you don't good, do good things to everybody else. But if you allowed me to touch him, he would blaspheme you to your face. Now we need to understand that all the sons of God are present there. The representatives of the worlds are, heaven, are there in the heavenly council. Now God could have said to Satan, nah, you're lying. Don't believe what he's saying. God could have said that, but the heavenly beings would have thought, hmm, what is God afraid of? And so God says to Satan, oh, so you say that he serves me for the loaves and the fishes? I'll let you do anything you want to him, only don't touch him. And so we know the story. The devil goes out and he afflicts uh, Job by making him lose everything that he has. Children, servants, beasts, Everything that he owned, he lost. And instead of blaspheming God, Job says, God gave and God has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And so how is God looking before the heavenly council? God is seen to be truthful. 
And Job is seen to be faithful to God because he loves God, not because of the loaves and the fishes. And so you have a second council meeting in heaven, and once again, the sons of God who had left the first meeting, it says that they come again to the presence of God, and God says uh, to Satan, have you seen my servant Job, that he's still faithful to me in spite of the fact that you turned me against him? And the devil says, of course, because you only let me take stuff away from him, but you didn't let me touch him. If you let me touch him, he would blaspheme you to your face. And so God could have said, no, no, the trial is over. He's never going to do that. He could have said that. The heavenly beings would have thought, mm, I wonder what, we wonder what God is really afraid of. You know, he's not letting uh, Satan do it because he's afraid that Job might apostatize. And so God says to Satan, okay, you know, you can do anything you want. You can touch him any way that you want. Only I forbid you to take his life, because if you take his life, then the trial is over. And so Satan goes out and he afflicts Job with boils from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. And then he loses the support of his wife. His wife says, curse God and die. And his three friends come to console him, and uh, even his three friends to turn to be his accusers. And then Job feels that God himself has forsaken him because he cries out to God, and God apparently does not listen to what he's saying. He's lost everything except his life. And yet Job remained faithful to God. God was shown true before the heavenly council, and Satan was shown to be wrong. Are you following me or not? And so we find in this story this controversy between heaven and earth and how God is made to look good when His people are faithful to Him even in the worst circumstances. Now what we're going to study, that was just the conclusion of our last study, and now we are going to enter into our study on the judgment, the judgment process. I'd like to begin by sharing with you a list of the beings in the universe that are involved in this controversy. First of all, God is involved. God is the accused. In the story of Job, it's not Job that is accused. God is accused of favoring Job. And so we need to understand that in the Bible, the devil, yes, he's, a, he's the accuser of the brethren, but primarily the devil is accusing God. And so the accused in the whole great controversy is God Himself. Now another group that is involved in this great controversy are the heavenly beings who remained faithful to God. And I've mentioned that those heavenly beings who remained faithful to God are first of all the angels that did not give in to Satan's temptations and secondly the representatives or the inhabitants of all of the worlds of the universe. So there is a group of heavenly beings that are faithful to God. They're involved in the great controversy because they're observing how the great controversy develops and how God is going to resolve this problem. Now there's also a group of earthly beings who are faithful to God. The earthly beings are composed of the righteous who died before the second coming of Christ and the righteous who will be alive when Jesus comes. And so among the righteous you have the dead in Christ who die before Jesus comes and you have the living righteous who will be alive and remain when Jesus comes. Then you also have a group of heavenly beings that are unfaithful which is the devil and his angels. They're heavenly beings, they were cast to the earth but they still had their origin in heaven. They also are involved in the great controversy. And finally you have a group of human beings on earth that are also unfaithful to God. So basically summarizing, God is the accused, there's a group of heavenly beings who are faithful to God, the angels and the inhabitants of the worlds, there's a group of earthly beings who are faithful to God, those who died in Christ and those who are alive when Jesus comes, you have a group of heavenly beings that were unfaithful to God, that is Satan and his angels, and finally you have a group of earthly beings that are unfaithful to God, which are those who chose sin and rejected Jesus Christ as their Savior. Now the purpose of the judgment is to clear up the issues of the great controversy before each one of these groups. In other words, when each one of these groups 
is persuaded and convinced that God was just and loving in the way in which He dealt with sin, only then will God be able to destroy sin and sinners. Every single group must be convinced. The heavenly beings who remain faithful to God, the earthly beings who remain faithful to God, the heavenly beings who were unfaithful to God, and the earthly beings who were unfaithful to God. When all of these groups have been persuaded, then God can bring the great controversy to an end, and He can cleanse the universe from sin and sinners. Now, there are three stages of the judgment process. You know, if you asked a, a, a common, ordinary Christian from any church, uh, when the judgment takes place, most likely they would tell you that the judgment takes place when Jesus comes. You know, and they get this, for example, from the Creed, where it says that Jesus will come to judge the living and the dead. So for them, the judgment is when Jesus comes for the second time. But even before that, you know, they don't realize it, but they believe that the judgment is when a person dies. Because most churches teach that when a person dies, if they were good, they were, they're whisked off to, off to heaven. And if they were, if they were wicked, they're, they're sent to hell. So basically, they were judged at a certain moment when they died. But they also say, well, you know, the ju final judgment is going to be when Jesus comes again. And then the righteous will be saved and the wicked then will be confined to hell, not only from death till the coming of Jesus, but forever and ever. That's basically their concept of the judgment. But the Bible describes the judgment not as an event. The judgment is a process. We need to understand that the judgment is not an event. The judgment is a process. A process that we're going to study began in 1844 and does not end until the wicked are destroyed after the millennium. So in other words, for hundreds and hundreds of years the judgment takes place and the judgment occurs in three successive stages. Now you say, what are the three successive stages? We're going to study those in a few moments, but I also would like to mention something else to set the stage for what we're going to discuss. Not only does the judgment take place in three successive historical stages, but each stage of the judgment consists of three steps. Each of those three stages consists of three steps. Now you say, what are the three steps? You know, the human system of jurisprudence is built on God's method of judgment. You say, how is that? The first step of each stage of the judgment is an investigation of the case. Let me ask you, do in earthly tribunals, when a judgment is going to take place, is the case examined first? Is the evidence presented first? Absolutely. You have an examination of the evidence, an investigation of the evidence. That is the first step of the judgment. The second step of the judgment is after the case has been evaluated, examined, investigated, and it's been discovered whether the person is innocent or guilty, then the sentence is pronounced. That's the second step of the judgment. And then, once the sentence is pronounced, the time comes for the third step, which is the execution of the sentence. Are you following me or not? Is that the way our system of justice works in the United States? Absolutely. Democratic countries operate that way. There's an investigation of the case to determine whether the person is innocent or guilty. Then you have the sentence based on the examination of the evidence. And finally you have the execution or the implementation of the sentence that was given based on the evidence. So what I want us to, to remember now as we're going to get into a study of the stages is there are three successive historical stages to the judgment and each of those stages follows these three steps. Investigation, sentence, and execution of the sentence. Now, the first uh, phase of the judgment takes place before the second coming of Christ. In fact, now we are living in the time of the judgment. Now you say, what is the purpose of this stage of the judgment? 
The purpose of this stage, and by the way, later on in this series, we're going to study this in much more detail. Today we're looking at the global picture so that later we'll be able to fit all of the pieces into the global picture. But what is the purpose of this stage of the judgment before the second coming of Christ? The purpose is to persuade the heavenly beings that God acted correctly in every case that is examined of those who profess Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord. You see, among those who profess Jesus, are there individuals who are true believers and others who are not true believers? Of course. Do you have... Do you have uh, true and false virgins? You have five wise and five what? Foolish. They all have a lamp. They all have the Bible and a certain measure of the oil, which is the Holy Spirit. And yet one group are counterfeit believers. In the church, are the, is there wheat and also tares in the church? Absolutely. Are there, there are those people who say, Lord, Lord, but Jesus says, I don't know you? Are they people who have the form of godliness but don't have the power of godliness in their lives? Are there even ministers that disguise themselves as ministers of righteousness when they're not really ministers of righteousness? Are there good and bad fish in the church that the fishermen bring into the boat or into the church? Absolutely. Are there true and counterfeit believers in the wedding chamber? You know the parable of Matthew chapter 22. And so not everybody who professes the name of Jesus Christ is a true believer. And so God is going to open up the records of all of those who profess the name of Jesus Christ. The judgment before the second coming is only of those who claimed Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord. To sift between the genuine and the counterfeit. Are you following me or not? And the purpose is that the heavenly beings will see that God acted correctly in every single case and that God has a right to bring those who are faithful believers to heaven with Him when He comes for the second time. In other words, does a judgment have to take place before Jesus comes to determine who Jesus can take to heaven? Of course. There has to be investigation, a sentence, and then when Jesus comes, He executes the sentence or He gives the reward. Are you following me or not? And so the purpose of the judgment before the second coming of Jesus is to separate true believers from counterfeit believers in the view of the heavenly jury so that uh, Jesus, when He comes to take the genuine believers, the whole universe will say, you brought the ones here who really were worthy to be brought here. The purpose of the second stage of the judgment we will look at after we examine some verses about the pre-advent investigative judgment. Now let's notice several texts in the Bible that describe this stage of the judgment before the second coming of Jesus. Go with me to Daniel chapter 7. We'll read verses 9 and 10 and then we'll read verses 13 and 14. Now you know Daniel 7 describes a series of beasts that represent historical stages. First of all you have a lion that represents the kingdom of Babylon. Then you have a bear which is the Medes and Persians. Then you have a leopard which represents Greece. Then you have a dragon beast that represents Rome. Then the dragon beast sprouts ten horns and that represents the divisions of the Roman Empire. Then among the ten horns rises a little horn, that's papal Rome, that rules for 1,260 years. At the end of the 1,260 years you have the verses that we're going to read now. Verse 9. I watched till thrones were put in place and the Ancient of Days was seated. Who is the Ancient of Days? It's God the Father. Where does the God the Father live? We pray, Our Father which art everywhere. No, that's not the way we pray. Our Father which art where? In heaven. The Father dwells in heaven. Remember that. I watched till thrones were put in place and the Ancient of Days was seated. Now if He was seated, He wasn't seated there before. Are you following me or not? His garment was white as snow, and the hair of His head was like pure wool. His thro throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before Him. A thousand thousands ministered to Him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before Him. Who are those? The ten thousand times ten thousand. The angels. Where do the angels live? In heaven. They're in the presence of the Father. And then notice what it says. The court was seated, 
and the books were opened. So what is going to begin at this point? The heavenly judgment. And it's going to take place in heaven. And it takes place after the year 1798 because this comes after the dominion of the little horn. Now Daniel 7 doesn't give us the exact date. We're going to study that a little bit later on, but it is after 1798. Now let's go uh, in, our, in our Bibles to verses 13 and 14. See the Father moves, He sits, and the judgment begins. And then immediately after, notice what happens in verse 13. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, who is that, the Son of Man? Jesus, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds, what are the clouds? The angels, coming with the clouds of heaven. Now the Millerites said, oh this is the second coming of Jesus. No, it's not the second coming of Jesus because it doesn't say here that the Son of Man comes to the earth. Where does He go? It says He came to the Ancient of Days. He goes to the judgment change chamber in heaven. It says He came to the Ancient of Days and they brought Him near before Him. Now why did Jesus go there? Why did Jesus go there to where the Father was and, he, and the Father sits to begin the judgment, the books are open, why does Jesus go there? Notice verse 14, Then to Him, that is to Jesus, was given dominion and glory and a what? So what does Jesus go there for? To receive what? The kingdom, to receive the kingdom. And they brought him near before. Uh, actually, let's go to verse 14 again. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is, is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. Now, what is Christ's kingdom? We usually have the tendency to think that the kingdom is a geographical territory. You know, uh, for example, the United Kingdom. We think that's uh, Ireland and Scotland and England. But in the Bible, when it speaks about the kingdom, it is really referring to the subjects of the kingdom, the people that belong to the kingdom. Now, is it necessary to, for an investigation in the judgment to be made to show who is a member of Christ's kingdom? Absolutely. And so Jesus goes to the Ancient of Days so that it can be revealed who are subjects of His kingdom, and when the judgment is over, His kingdom is made up, because it's been determined who the subjects of His kingdom are. Now let's go also to Revelation 14, 6 and 7. We're talking about the first step of the first phase of the judgment, the investigative stage. Notice Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 and 7. This is the first angel's message. You know, in Revelation you have three messages which are God's last message to the world. And this is the first of the three. It says there in Revelation 14, 6 and 7, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Uh, question. Uh, while the gospel is preached, can people still be saved? That's kind of a dumb question, but I ask a dumb question to make a point. Of course, if the gospel is preached to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, people can still be saved, right? The door of mercy has not closed. But now notice what verse 7 continues saying. It says in verse 7, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment will come. Thank you very much. In the Greek it is an aorist, that is a past tense. In other words, the first angel is saying, the hour of his judgment has come. Does the judgment then begin while the gospel is being preached? Very clearly the gospel is preached and the judgment begins while the gospel is being preached. So must the judgment, the investigative stage anyway, be before the second coming of Christ? Absolutely. Now, I want you to notice also the moment when the sentence is pronounced. After the judgment comes to an end, this investigative stage, the first step of the first phase of the judgment, as soon as it's finished, a pronouncement is made. It's found in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 11. This is the sentence. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 11. It says there, He who is unjust, 
let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he who is holy, let him be holy still. Does that sound pretty final? Pretty much, because it's describing the close of probation after each case has been examined and investigated. And the kingdom of Christ is made up because Christ has revealed before the heavenly universe who is his true child, who is a genuine believer. Now, after this, in the very next verse, we have the time when the sentence is executed or when the sentence, uh, when the sentence is rewarded. Notice Revelation chapter 22 and verse 12. Jesus says, And behold, I am co coming quickly, and my reward is with me. What does Jesus bring when He comes? His what? Now if Jesus brings the reward, must He have determined in the judgment before what the reward is going to be? Of course, absolutely. And so here you have the implementation or the execution of the verdict that was given in the judgment. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. So here you have the first phase of the judgment. It's before the second coming. It is to judge the righteous, for Christ to make of His kingdom and reveal to the heavenly universe who is worthy of being taken to heaven when Jesus comes. Then you have the sentence where every case has been decided and then Jesus comes to give the reward based on the sentence that was given, which is based on the investigation that was made. Follows the same system of jurisprudence of the United States and many other democratic countries. We copied it from God, actually. Now, there's a second stage of the judgment. The second stage takes place during the thousand years. Now, during the thousand years, this is after the second coming, during the thousand years, the righteous will be in heaven because Jesus is going to come to take them to heaven, right? The Bible tells us, Jesus says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. So when Jesus comes the second time, He takes His people to heaven. He takes the saints to heaven, those who have been pro proven worthy in the judgment to be taken there. And then in heaven, God's people will in be involved in a process of judgment. Now for whose benefit is this stage of the judgment? It's for the benefit of the righteous. You see, are there going to be a lot of people missing in heaven that the righteous felt should be there? That had pretty moral lives and they're wondering, hey, you know, why isn't so and so here? That person was so nice. He never spoke an evil word, you know, and Jesus is going to open up the records to the saints who went to heaven with him and he's going to show to them how he was righteous and true, gave every opportunity to all of those who stayed behind to be saved and that they rejected salvation. When this phase of the judgment ends, God's people are going to be convinced that everyone that is there deserves to be there and everybody that stayed behind deserved to stay behind. It's to persuade the righteous that God acted correctly in every single case. Are you following me? Now, let's notice the, the stages of this second phase of the judgment. Go with me to Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4. Here we have the investigation and the sentencing. Notice what it says there in verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. So notice that those who sit on thrones, they are going to receive the work of judgment. They're going to be working in a judgment during the thousand years. So it continues saying, I saw thrones and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God. Now don't get all hung up over, over the souls crying out. You know, this is figurative language. This is not literal language. The word soul in the New Testament is also translated life. In fact, in the Bible it says that the blood of man is his soul. The blood is his life. 
probably the best explanation for the souls crying out here, uh, they're the same souls that were crying out under the fifth seal in Revelation 6, 9 through 11, is the story of Cain and Abel. Wasn't injustice done in the case of the uh, story of Cain and Abel? Did the, did the bad guy live and the good guy die? Of course. What happened with the blood of Abel? What did the blood of Abel do? God said to Cain, the blood of your brother Abel cries out to me from the ground. So it's the life of Abel that is crying out. It's not some immortal, intangible soul that's flying off somewhere. And so here it says, once again, I saw thrones and they sat on them. This is the righteous. They go to heaven and judgment was committed to them. They're going to judge. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness of, to Jesus and for the word of God and had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands and they lived, and what did they do? They reigned with Christ a thousand years. So those who are going to judge during the thousand years, are they going to be alive and in heaven during the thousand years? Yes. And so you say, but Pastor Bohr, who are they going to judge? Well, let's read another text that describes this judgment during the thousand years, and then the Bible gives us an answer of who the righteous or the saints are going to be judging during the thousand years. Notice Revelation chapter 20 and verses 11 and 12. Revelation chapter 20 verses 11 and 12. Verse, verse 11 is describing the second coming of Christ. We need to understand that. Revelation 20 11 is describing the second coming of Christ and verse 12 is describing the judgment during the millennium. Now let's notice verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was no place for them. So notice, heaven and earth fade away, and there is no place for them. Now you say, how do you know that that's describing the second coming? Because this same idea is repeated in Revelation 6, verses 14 through 17. Let's read that carefully. Speaking about the second coming, it says, Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, rolled, up, rolled up. So you see, the heavens fade away. And then it says, And every mountain and island was moved out of its what? There's the key word, out of its place. So Revelation 20, 11 and Revelation 6 and verse 14 are describing the second coming of Jesus. And then of course it continues saying in verse 15, And the kings of the earth, and the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man, hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? This is describing the second coming of Christ, right? So is he sitting on a throne according to this at the second coming? Absolutely, it speaks about one who is seated on the throne. Does it say that the heaven fades away as a scroll? Yes. Does it say that every mountain and island on earth disappears? Of course. And so Revelation 20 verse 11 is describing the second coming of Jesus. Let's read it again. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face earth and the heaven fled away and there was no place for them. And then notice what comes next. What comes next in verse 13 is the millennial judgment after the second coming. Notice what it says in verse 12. And I saw the dead. Which dead would this be? Is this the righteous dead? No, because the righteous dead resurrected when Jesus came. So which dead must this be? It must be the wicked dead. And so it says, And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And I say, now wait a minute, Pastor, how can dead people stand before God? Does it say that these are dead people standing before God? Yes, that's what it says. It says, and I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and now notice this, and the dead were judged. So when they're judged, are they dead? When they're judged, are they dead? Yes or no? Yes, it says, and the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. So how is it that the dead stand before God? We're going to study this in more detail later on. They stand before God through the record of their life in the heavenly books. They don't stand there personally 
And believe me, we have a whole lecture where we're going to deal with this aspect of the judgment. When it says that the dead stand before God and the dead are judged during the millennium, what it simply is saying is that God keeps a biography of everyone on earth of their entire life in the heavenly records, and that is what exa is examined during the thousand years. The, the dead as individuals are dead during the thousand years, but they are before the throne of God through the record of their lives. Are you following me or not? And by the way, I'm going to cover this with luxury of detail later on in our series. So notice it says that the dead are judged during the thousand years. Now the question is, who are they going to judge? Well, here we have uh, something very interesting, a text that many people don't even look at. Adventists do, but, uh, but from other churches. It's like this uh, text doesn't really exist in the minds of people. Notice 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verses 1 to 3. It clearly says who the saints are going to judge. The Apostle Paul is speaking here of lawsuits, that we should not take one another to court. And he says this, Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? In other words, if you have a beef with one of the church members, are you going to take that case to the worldly courts to make the church look bad? Verse 2, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? What? What does the world mean? It must be the worldlings. It's not talking about the righteous. It's not talking about the saved. Jesus said, love not the world, nor the things that are in the world. He says that he makes, who makes himself an, a friend of the world is an enemy of God. So the word world refers to the unrighteous. So the Apostle Paul is saying, don't you know that the saints are going to judge the unrighteous? But not only the unrighteous. Notice what he continues saying uh, in verse 2. And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know that we shall judge what? Angels! How much more things that pertain to this life? What are the saints going to judge? Not only the ungodly, the world, but they are going to judge what? Angels. Which angels would those be? The righteous angels? Do the righteous angels need a judgment? No. It's the wicked angels who need a judgment. And so it says clearly here that the saints will judge the world, the ungodly, and they will judge the fallen angels, Satan and his angels. And by the way, this is exactly what Revelation 20 verse 4 says. It says judgment was committed to them. God's people will judge during the thousand years because God wants to show them that He was right in taking those to heaven that He did and in leaving behind those that He left behind. Now there's another step or another phase to the judgment, the third phase of the judgment. It takes place after the thousand years. Now let me just say, you're, you're probably wondering, you say, okay, we understood the uh, investigation, we understood the sentencing, but where is the execution of the sentence of those who were judged during the thousand years? Well, the execution of the sentence doesn't take place until after the thousand years. That's when the wicked are cast where? Into the lake of fire with the devil and his angels. That's the execution of the sentence that is investigated and pronounced during the thousand years. But let's talk briefly about the judgment that takes place after the thousand years. Now who does God want to convince of His righteousness and of His love in the judgment that takes place after the thousand years? Well, the purpose of the judgment after the thousand years is to even convince the wicked and Satan and his angels that God was right in excluding them from heaven. In other words, God is, is going to prove before the heavenly beings that He was right, He's going to prove before the saints that He was right, and He's going to prove to the devil and his angels and the wicked that He was right. And only when the whole universe recognizes that God was right in His judgment will God be able to eradicate sin because everybody will be on the same page. Are you following me or not? What a wonderful God who even is going to make it necessary for the wicked and the devil and his angels to see the righteousness of their sentence and how God is love. Now let's read 
several texts that describe the judgment after the second coming of Jesus. Go with me to Revelation chapter 20 and verse 13. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 13. This is describing what happens after the millennium. So notice, Revelation 20 11 is the second coming. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 12 is the judgment during the thousand years when the dead stand before God. But verse 13 describes the time when the dead are going to resurrect, the wicked dead are going to resurrect. Notice once again Revelation 20 and verse 13. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades, Hades is the grave by the way, death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. What do these expressions mean? The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and the grave delivered up the dead who were in them. What does it mean, gave up and delivered up? It's talking about the what? The resurrection of the wicked. In a moment I'm going to read you another parallel verse that uh, uses similar language. And notice what it continues saying, uh, and they were judged each one according to his works. So is there a judgment that takes place after the resurrection of the wicked? Absolutely, very clearly this verse tells us so. It says the sea gives up the dead in it, that's the resurrection of the wicked, death and the grave deliver up the dead that were in them, and then it says that once they're raised they are what? They are judged each one according to his works. They were judged during the thousand years so that the saints could see while they were lost, whereas after the thousand years they are judged while they are alive so that they can confess the justice of their sentence and Satan and his angels themselves will bow and say that God has acted correctly, God has been right. Notice Isaiah 26 and verse 19 where uh, this uh, idiom is used about giving up. Uh, Rev, uh, Isaiah 26 verse 10 says, Your dead shall live, together with my dead body they shall arise. Awake and sing, you who dwell in the dust. Who are those who dwell in the dust? It's the dead, right? The dead dwell in the dust. And then it says, For you do is like the dew of herbs, and the earth shall what? The earth shall cast out the dead. You see the similarity in the terminology that we found in the book of Revelation? And so, after the millennium, the Bible tells us in Revelation 20 and verse 5, that the rest of the dead resurrect after the thousand years. And when they resurrect, they will be able to see. There will be an investigation that will show them the righteousness of their sentence. And then they will kneel and they will pronounce their own sentence. They will say, just and true are your ways, O God. We deserve to be destroyed. You gave us an opportunity to be saved and we rejected it. And then what is going to happen? God is going to execute the judgment that was determined in the investigation and was shown to these wicked people and to the devil and his angels. Are you following me or not? Now let's notice the execution of the sentence in Revelation 20 verses 14 and 15 and then we will notice Revelation 21 and verse 8. This is the, the sentence, this is the sentence and the execution, the final execution of the sentence. It says, Then death and Hades, that is the grave, were cast into the lake of fire. This is the what? The second death. Now let's, let's unpack that for a moment. What is the death that the wicked are going to suffer? suffer? What is their final punishment for sin? The second death. Can you have a second death unless you had the first? No. Let me, let me tell you what the scenario is. Many who lived before the second coming of Christ, ungodly, died, right? Before Jesus came. And then others died when Jesus came, right? So all of the wicked were dead. Did they die once? Yes, that's their first death. Is that their punishment for sin? No, why couldn't it be? Because they have not seen their day in court. See, God is going to show them in a court of law that He was right. He would not pronounce, He would not give them second death without them saying that we deserve it. Are you following me or not? And so basically what we find is that God uh, reveals to them their cases and then they will suffer second death which means that the first death was before Jesus came or at the moment of the second coming of Jesus. And the second death is a death from which there will be no resurrection. 
That is the final execution of the sentence against those who rejected Jesus. So it says in verse uh, 14 and 15, Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now you say, Pastor, what was in the books that condemned the wicked? Oh, we don't have to guess because the Bible gives us a description of what was found in the records of the wicked. Notice Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars. Is that a list of, uh, of the things that are found in the records of the wicked? Absolutely. What's going to happen with them? Based on what is found in the books, all of these sins of which they did not repent, they did not confess them, and they did not trust in Jesus as their Savior, it says, they shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is what? Which is the second death. So does this, uh, does this make sense, what we studied this evening? You see, the judgment is not an event. The judgment is a process, a three-phase process. And each phase is composed of three steps. Investigating the case, then pronouncing the sentence based on the evidence, and finally executing the sentence based on the evidence and the pronunciation of the sentence. In other words, God will not condemn anyone without them having their day in court. They will confess before the universe that God was right. God will convince all of the heavenly universe that He was just and He was loving. He will convince the righteous during the thousand years that He was just and He was loving in leaving behind those who stayed behind and in taking to heaven those whom He took. And finally, he will even convince the devil and his angels and the wicked themselves that he has dealt justly with them, that he loved them, that he gave them every opportunity to receive Jesus as Savior. He gave them every opportunity to be saved, and yet every opportunity was slighted and rejected. And therefore, Satan and his angels and the wicked will pronounce their own sentence. They will say, just and true are your ways, O God. And then, and only then, will God be able to destroy sin and sinners from the universe because everybody is on the same page. Don't we have a wonderful God? A God who cares what His creatures think. Now, don't miss our next study. We will be studying about the entrance of Jesus as the Lamb to the camp of God's people.